What's up guys, Saf here on Super Saf Speaks and welcome to episode number 19 of the podcast with myself, your host, Super Saf. And Thunder E from Border Work, your co-host. Who is wearing a shirt today. He's just come back from an interview. Um, <laughs> no, no, that's not true. That's not true. I've, I've not seen you with a shirt on your channel or the podcast before. Uh, I have in the past, but um, today I was doing some filming in the city, so I decided to wear some new threads. There you go. All right. So today we're going to be talking. We've got lots of leaks this week. So the the, the main area of focus will be the leaks. We've got the Z Fold 3. There's been some major leaks around that. The Z Flip 3 as well. Some very notable leaks iPhone 13 leaked information, so more iPhone 13 uh, info here, as well as a potential iPhone Fold that's going to be coming at some point. So we'll, we've will we got lots to talk about, but also we're going to go slightly into the weird and wonderful, and uh, we're going to be discussing some of my 4am thoughts, <laughs> one of which is, will YouTube still exist in 100 years? And if it does, how will it exist? So we'll get to all of that. There's, uh, there's lots to cover. I also want to mention that we've had a few issues with Apple Podcasts since they kind of released their new subscription model. It seems like the episodes are not being pushed out to all listeners. So uh, do bear with us. Hopefully we'll get that sorted out soon if you are somebody who normally listens on Apple Podcasts. Anyway, so E, let's start off with the Samsung Galaxy Z Fold three that's a that's a long name uh we'll just obviously call it fold three now we've had some interesting leaks on weibo right so there's been mm -hmm. some images that actually look pretty genuine they look like they have been taken from a promo video uh that uh, samsung usually has pretty low quality however now the first thing that we we have there's a there's a screenshot from uh ice universe who's a, a very uh, prominent leaker and that says 120 hertz inside and out so at this point the z fold 2 has a um a high refresh rate for the fold out display but the cover display is still 60 hertz this is going to be 120 hertz on both which would make it the first foldable to have 120 hertz on both the outside as well as the inside so mm -hmm. that that's the first piece of news which looks pretty exciting but then there's some some really really cool stuff so then there's a screenshot which shows take calls while taking notes taking calls while taking notes right and we can see an s pen so the z fold is kind of folded halfway and then there is an s pen which confirms the rumors that we've had that the z fold 3 will have an s pen so that's the second piece of big news and then the third piece, which, uh, you know, I was a little bit skeptical about, but now it's seeming more likely. We also see a screenshot where there's text that says the first foldable with an under display camera. So currently we have a punch out on the foldable display of the Z mm -hmm. Fold 2. And this is something, you know, that can be a little bit distracting, but it looks like Samsung may have figured out a way to get it under the display without it being um, really bad quality like we've seen on some, some other <laughs> implementations, shall we say. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, it's looking exciting. I think, you know, the, the rumored date for release is around July, I believe. Yeah, which so, makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Z Fold 3. Uh, let, let me hear your thoughts based on all of this information. I mean, all I hear is fire, 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 fire. <laughs> Samsung is, is just clicking on all cylinders. Um, I mean, look. Having 220 hertz displays on one device, uh, it's that's a battery drain. We know that, but at least it's there, and you can drop it down to 60 hertz if you like or whatever. Uh, the S Pen again for me. I mean, you know how much I love the Galaxy Note. I'm holding my Galaxy Note 20 right now. I just got a new case to move to S21, and again, this is almost six months. I still haven't moved to the S21 because of that. Um, mm. And then finally, that on the display. Um, under display front-facing camera or camera at least 
is something that will be quite interesting to see what Samsung does. And we will probably will see limitations in this quality. It might just be 1080p instead of 4K, um, hmm. you know. And it might be for one of the cameras, not both of the cameras. So maybe in, you know, the the bigger display, the one that folds open might have the un under display, while the one in the front of the main camera will have a traditional, you know, like a punch hole or something uh, in there. But... I Honestly, it's it's sounding good. As long as as long as that S Pen goes inside, then I am hundred percent sold. If not, I will be at like ninety five. Okay. So so there's an interesting point you mentioned there because um, it seems like at least at this point, unless Samsung's figured it out, that you would, for an under display camera, it's not going to be as good as you know what you'd normally get because if there's yeah. something that's not got anything covering. So I do think I, I do agree with you where it might be that the cover display does have. A traditional punch out camera because that's what you'd normally be using for selfies and to be honest if you do want to take selfies you can just fold it open and use the rear facing cameras for selfies using the cover yeah. display right which but is much better when you're uh, what you traditionally been using when when the when the uh the fold is open right is for video calls right now when you're when you're on video calls you don't need more than 1080p right 4k you don't need 4k for for video calls there's nothing that's no, going to stream too much bandwidth. at that level yeah. yeah so i kind of i kind of see that and you know that would be a very interesting implementation i'm i'm very interested to see how they're going to implement the s pen because remember the current fold you could use your nail on that plastic display dig in and it's going to leave permanent marks on the display now, I'm mm -hmm. kind of thinking, okay, how do they do this with the S Pen? So it's rumored to have Gorilla Glass Victus on the outside, obviously, but we're still going to have Glastic or whatever you want to call it, the uh, plastic Internally, with yeah. the glass. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see, are they going to make the nib of the S Pen a little bit more blunt or something, maybe? So then, you know, it, you, it's not as sharp as what we've traditionally seen on Note devices. I don't know. This is this is going to be quite interesting. So um, exciting, nevertheless. There's, there's a few yeah. question marks, but... We're going to be finding out all of these things hopefully very soon and with the camera module as well it's not going to be you know a wider rectangle like we've got on the z fold 2 right now it looks like it's going to be more of a narrow vertical camera alignment so you know similar mm -hmm. to what we had in the note 10 um so yeah. it's just in a row and that that tells us that there's not going to be periscope zoom or anything like that so you know we're not going to be getting um crazy amounts of zoom like we've seen on the yeah S21. i mean I, I think it's fine i mean the s21 really brings the the best traditional phone experience mm. right and and this is an untraditional experience so uh it's good to see more untraditional things like an s pen and also the under display fingerprint and maybe this is this is where samsung maybe this is also part of the reason why the note line isn't going to be there anymore or it's mm. at least pause for a while because now remember the note used to be the untraditional things that happened the samsung did while the s line of course has always been the traditional so this is a way now to do more untraditional stuff and then you still have your s line if you want some nice traditional you know smartphones yeah i mean very exciting coming soon samsung galaxy z flip 3 as well so this is the clamshell foldable and we've seen some very prominent leaks in the past week Again, a lot of these are coming on Weibo, so we've we've got some of the promo materials. There seems to be four colors that are going to be available at least. We've got a green, a violet, a beige, and a gray. But the design almost looks like a Pixel 2 that can fold in half, right? So yeah. that's something that everybody's saying because we've got this um, glossy black area at the when the, when, when the device is closed, we can see two cameras. So we're likely to have the standard primary as well as an ultra wide camera. But we do now see a much larger cover display. So the Z, uh, Z Flip, sorry, I said Z Flip 3. This would be the Z Flip 2 actually, sorry, because the Z Flip was actually the first of its, uh, um, of its kind. Of its kind, So. Yeah. So we see a much bigger, more usable cover display because the cover display uh, on actually, the original Z Flip was very small. I actually, I think, according to rumors, though, it's, it looks like it's going to be called Z Flip 3. They are basically yeah. matching, matching I mean, uh, the fold. They, they, they have done that before where they've kind of skipped the number to kind of, you know, put things in line. So I wouldn't be surprised, yeah, if they if they did do that. Um, but yeah, the larger cover display would make it much more usable. We can see from some of these screenshots that you've got um, some notification information that would actually be much more readable than what we had on the original Z Flip um 
it's it's looking good. What do you think about the fact that it looks like a folded Pixel 2 E? <laughs> I mean, I, I can see that it looks better just because pixel colors were always very pastel and mute. Um, mm. I just never was a fan of those those color tones. Um, and I also like the fact that yeah, the, uh, the display on the very top is bigger, but not too big. And I get, you know, I know Mr. Mobile loved the larger display on the Motorola, uh, mm. at least just, just for viewing purposes. But... I don't know. I mean, I I like this. I like the way the Z Flip had a small display because I wanted to open my. I wanted to flip open my phone. Like that's just me, you know, with that mindset. But it looks like it's going to be, um, you know, the continuation of that line. We'll see some new features. We'll see more performance. I really hope that. I really wish that Samsung would go with the 870 and the Z Flip and bring that price under a thousand dollars because to me that would really you know, get more people into foldables as well. Uh, you, you know, the, the, you know, the Z Fold 3, sure, you know, let, let's, let's push out all the bells and whistles, but I, I, Samsung, you're listening, 870 on the Z Flip, get it to 999 or something like that and okay. go. Okay, let's predict, let's, obviously there's no pricing information as yet, but let's put a prediction on the Z Flip 3 pricing. I'm gonna say $1,200. <laughs> I mean, you're probably right, but I'll just go with 999 just because I want I wanted to hit that mark. You, you know what's going to be really fu funny is if they go in 1100 and then we're like, <laughs> boom, bang in the middle. So um, I'm hopeful for 1100, but I think uh, if, I, if I'm being realistic, it's going to be 1200. And I don't know, I just really, I mean, there's so many fans of the flip, right? Uh, Austin Evans, uh, Quinn. Uh, Quinn, loves, Quinn loves they that. They absolutely like, love the Z flip. And, and you know, I, I really do think that's more of a, it's more of a uh, popular, I would say it's, it's, it's more of a mainstream form factor because you're still getting your full five, six inch smartphone display experience, which you're used to, but then you can fold it in half. And, and I quite like that idea. Whereas the uh, fold is more of if you want a tablet, right? So yeah, it's yeah. it's kind of like, okay, do you want a smartphone that turns into a tablet? And that, although is more useful, should we say, it's, uh, not something everybody wants like you don't not everybody wants a tablet all the time so yeah. i mean but it's nice to have these options and you know samsung is obviously leading the way here in foldables but it looks like apple may be joining the foldable race soon so we've got a new report so here on gsm arena it says according to one of the most reliable apple analysts ming chiku i hope i'm saying that right my apologies the Cupertino-based tech giant is working on a foldable iPhone of its own and will be ready in 2023. So still a couple of years away. The report even has a couple of specs, right? So with the help of some industry sources, uh, Ku was uh, able to scoop up some supplier information. For instance, the display will be about eight inches when folded out diagonally and uh, will have a Quad HD plus resolution. The supplier will once again be Samsung. Of course, Samsung is the display supplier of the world right now, uh, smartphone mm -hmm. display supplier of the world, uh, but will use silver nanowire touch tech developed by TPK due to its compelling advantages over Samsung's white octa approach, right? The shipment target of the said foldable devices believed to be between 15, and, uh, between 15 and 20 million units, right? Mm -hmm. So, Apple, traditionally, as we know, they're not the first to kind of jump onto a new trend. They generally wait and see if something actually picks up and wait for the technology to come to a point where they can be like, okay, now we're bringing it along, right? They weren't the first to, to bring 5G. They let everybody else kind of do that trial and error. And then once they thought it was uh, something viable for their iPhones, they bought it over. Um, a lot of these things that we've seen from Apple, they want the first with wireless charging, with faster charging, etc. So foldables clearly seem to be popular and something that a lot of people want to see. And I would say, realistically speaking, the next big thing in the smartphone space. Samsung is obviously leading, but we've seen lots of promising devices from Huawei, Xiaomi, Motorola, and it would make sense for Apple to join this but again, the 2023 timeline actually makes sense as well to me because 
it's not like Apple are just going to jump into something like this very quickly. Yeah, it's going to be a foldable iPad, not a phone. Honestly, I don't see it as being a in in that traditional sense being a phone. I think if you look at look at the way Apple is positioned now, and you know we're going to talk about you know the iPhone 13. But, you know, we've seen people now talk about M1 chips in the iPhone. We, we said that first. I see that progression where this can be that device because Apple has a very polished tablet piece of software, right? Mm. Um, no one else does. And Apple has also a very polished smartphone software. And granted, they are different. They are also very similar <laughs> at the same time. So having it feel more like a a more portable iPad than it being a phone, which will help segment it out and even grow and increase because then that eats into this other mark as opposed to just, you know, the iPhone. Again, I could be very wrong, but I think Apple, this would be Apple's true first hybrid device because again, it's on the very same ecosystem they can run with in terms of applications and usability in there. So are you saying that you think it's going to be an iPad fold which wouldn't also work as a smartphone or are you saying that the primary focus would be that it's a it's an ipad that can be also a phone i i think it's an ipad that can be a phone but i think they will take the ipad approach as being okay. that's the line that it comes from uh, because again the apple pencil would be will be tied into it we all know how good it is a lot of people love to use it especially artists and things like that so why fold an iphone when you can fold it an ipad and again, you can you can run. I mean, an iPad runs LTE. You can have the same set of apps to make phone calls and all that stuff, right? Uh, all you need is basically phone calls. Really, every other app works. So, so, so th this is an interesting point because I think an advantage that Apple kind of has is the fact that they have iPad OS, right? So, iPad OS yeah. is made for tablet, right? And you've exactly. got all of these features. So. But but what would be interesting is if they when you folded the device and they it, say they do have a covered display. Obviously, we don't know if they're going to have a covered display or not. But say if they do have a covered display, if it's more of an iOS format and then mm -hmm. it turns into iPad OS, both in one device, I think that would be quite compelling because obviously you know foldables they have their own sort of skins and you know they, they're trying to do multi-screen and all of this stuff, right? But it's still Android, right? It's not yeah, yeah. A, a specific tablet-based. Um, format exactly. for the old Sam Samsung like has to try and do a lot of things to cover it. But also look at yeah. that market where the iPad is becoming a very expensive tool. And again, there are people who would want to have both, can afford both. And this becomes that bridge device. It may not be as powerful as, say, the M1 iPad, right? Because that's, of course, that's that's the big boy, that's the beast, that's the one. But it's still going to be more powerful than anything else because it will be running the so, whatever A A seventeen or whatever it is. Then, so I, I disagree with you there slightly because of the price element. Because you have the regular iPads, right, which are actually quite affordable. Like you're looking at around four hundred dollars, oh, yes. and they I, actually I totally, do. Totally forgot about that. You, yeah. you, you're thinking pro level, right? So yeah, right yeah. now, if you were to buy a, a, a baseline iPhone 12 for about 800 and then spend another 400, it's going to be about 1200 for two devices, right? And now True. I would very much doubt that this foldable, even if it comes out in two years time, is going to be around the 1200 mark. I would expect it mm. to be more around the 1500 at least. It'll be right? 15, yeah. Yeah. It'll be 15, so so I, I would disagree with you on the price side. I, I, I agree. But I think also, again, be, let's put it this way. It's coming out. It's stated to come out in two more years. Because it's coming out in two more years and because of development of foldables, it, Apple was still priced at 15, which is good for them. Yeah. I was just, I was doing the math out loud in the sense that the cost of production will actually be around eight to 900, but they were still priced at $1,500 because it's always the Apple tax. Hey, well, I mean, <laughs> Nevertheless, I think it's an exciting time for foldables. And I do think, um, you know, something I was talking to Fisher about as well, it does seem like the next big thing in, in the smartphone space. But until that happens and those become a lot more mainstream, we will be getting the iPhone 13s this year. Now, we've already covered some leaks of the iPhone 13 previously here in the podcast. We saw a leak of the iPhone 13 mini, which has a very similar design, but diagonal display, uh, diagonal camera alignment. 
But we've just had a new leak uh, and reading this article from GSM Arena. We've been hearing the fact that iPhones are going 120s this year for a while now. And today a new report from Korea basically confirms that while adding some intriguing new info. Only the iPhone 13 and iPhone 13 Pro Max are said to have the new LTPO AMOLED screens with 120Hz refresh rate and these will be made exclusive by Samsung Display. Not just that, but Samsung Electromechanics will supply the rigid flexible printed circuit boards and these are used to connect the OLED panel to the main board. So last year we were hoping that the iPhone 12s would have 120 hertz displays that didn't happen it was something that we were very much expecting on the iPhone 13s and this report pretty much confirms it now it's kind of expected that it would be just for the pro models so hey if you want to get the high refresh rates the smoother displays then you got to go for the pros right so mm -hmm. the regulars won't have this right now What's interesting is because I remember when the talk about the iPhone 12s having 120 hertz displays, there were lots of rumors around that. But then it kind of seemed like because of the sheer amount of iPhones Apple sells, right? They sell in the millions. They would not be able to get those displays. The supply just wouldn't match up the demand, right? For the iPhone 12 and the 12, sorry, the iPhone 12 Pro and the 12 Pro Max. So obviously now they've had a lot of time to kind of get those supplies done and it looks like the 13s will finally have a 120 hertz display i think it's actually slightly the opposite i don't think it was necessarily supply i think it was the fact that apple wanted to get the ltpo display um and wanted to see how well it worked in terms of battery life because already we know very well how much 5g chews up battery life right um mm. and it and the iphones on 5g running 60 hertz it just drains so going to 120 will be just another and apple doesn't want to mince those things for its customers so you know okay. samsung has used the ltpo it works now well okay cool we'll take it we'll we'll use it for the pro and pro max because again pro users want that as opposed to the, the others but it's nice to see i was going to see the other thing from this article means that it looks like um samsung is going to have a good fourth quarter this year because besides their own devices they will be supplying it looks according to the article says they were supplying for the iphone 12 and 13 this year up to 110 million oled panels as well as those pcb boards that's a lot of cash not saying you should buy samsung stock but you know what hey just putting it out there <laughs> i mean this is the advisor. thing though <laughs> it's i mean samsung's killing it in the, in the display game i mean pretty much all of the flagship displays that we get and also now camera sensors as well they're doing a lot more in because we've seen yeah. like the xiaomi mi 11 ultra has the has the samsung um uh, uh sensor for the yeah. 108 megapixel camera uh sorry the 64 megapixel camera they've obviously got a lot of 108 megapixel cameras that are being distributed as well so they're doing pretty well so yeah i mean samsung's it's, it's looking good for samsung and i mean I would definitely like to see 120 hertz. That's one of the things that I really found kind of missing on the pro models, at least um, of the iPhones, uh, the current iPhones. I mean, for an Apple user who's not experienced that, I mean, they may have experienced that on the iPad Pros, but that's not experienced that on a smartphone. Probably it's not something that they're gonna be necessarily missing, but once you do experience it, it it's it's something that you really do notice, especially when you go- Oh, you, you never wanna go degrees. back. Yeah, you never wanna go, want go back. back. But yeah, I mean, September, October time is when we're going to be seeing the new iPhones. And of course, we're going to be having more information as time goes on. And we'll be covering it right here at the podcast. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, we want to end with something a little bit off topic, as we normally do. I tweeted uh, a few days ago. And this is just me not being able to sleep and just having these random 4 a.m. thoughts. But I tweeted asking, do we think... YouTube will still exist in 100 years. And if it does exist in 100 years, what are they going to do with all that content? Are they going to get rid of old content? Are they going to archive it? Are they going to, you know, like just keep it all like a like an archive for history? And this kind of sparked up quite a big debate. There was so many replies of people kind of saying, there's one side of, you know, people saying that the world might not even exist in 100 years. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. That, I mean... It's a valid point. You never know. You never know. Like, what's going to happen in the next 10 years? We don't know, right? So, will it still exist? But YouTube, as, 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 
you know a service that's there obviously we've seen so many companies come and go right so we've seen yeah. you know the likes of all these social media giants like you know we've seen myspace we've seen uh, yahoo get go from place to place all of these things somebody mentioned geocities right <laughs> those Ooh, old websites oh, that are boy. just completely archived but i think youtube is quite different because as far as i can see even in the next 10 years i still think because Yes, we might have other forms of video, like short form video, but YouTube's always got a place because it's a place for searchable and, you know, just informative content, which you really don't find in the same format anywhere else, right? And it's yeah. been going on for how many years? Like 15 years plus, and it's been dominant for yeah. 15 plus years, and it doesn't seem to be slowing down. So I can at least see, you know, for the foreseeable future carrying on, obviously we don't know about in a in 100 years. That's obviously a big, big question mark. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's an interesting question because in a hundred years we don't know. I, st I still think the planet will be around in a hundred years. I, I I I'm going to live to 120, so at least I have a few years close to that mark. I'm not going to tell you my age. I'm really young, by the way. <laughs> but those, um, those evergreen Nigerian genes. So you, you, so he, I mean, he could be. 70 years old for all you know you just you you just never know because you'll always look young <laughs> yeah i sorry i just you know i'm just gonna, i'm keeping on the low right now but i think when it comes to this um i think it's going to be our digital video archive and one of the things that we tend to forget about youtube is you know we're on youtube we're youtubers we talk about tech and we also forget that there are so many different categories in youtube so prime example harvard University has lectures on YouTube, which means there's an educational just basin of knowledge, right? Of video knowledge that you can watch. Um, many companies have courses on YouTube. You know, people do networking. Well, I've got my buddy, I'll say, who would watch networking videos and just put on 2 XP and just kind of blow through. Because it's, you know, it's all, there's a lot of educational base besides even the entertainment and also periods. So I think. It's an interesting thing that I hope YouTube is thinking themselves also right now and Google as a company because this archive will change from video to maybe a different type of visual format, whether it is, you know, by that time we're just doing neural sensors and we're just, you know, getting the information in or it's VR or it's a hologram. But I, I hope they're thinking of classifying their content in terms of stages and eras because as we move, it's going to change. You know, we, we are, you know, we've got Gen Z's now and how they look at our content as we grew up, right? The kind of movies and shows and things like that. So I think it's, it's going to be very interesting. I hope it stays. Um, I don't know. When I get to, to that time, I'll let you guys know. So, <laughs> so here's, here's the thing. So, you know, cause, cause video is a format, right? Like the way I see it is, okay, we've got written um, books and stuff, right? So we've got books from centuries ago. I mean, sure, we've now got them in digital form and the language might have changed slightly, but the books are still in its form. I mean, they've not changed. Yeah. They're still books, okay? So, you know, we're talking hundreds of years and they've still carried on, right? Now, if we look at video as a format over the past, however long it's been, right? Even if you look at back at the, uh, you know, uh, early 1900s when we had like Charlie Chaplin movies and stuff, it's still mm -hmm. video. And we still yeah. watch it in the same way. We still consume it in the same way. Sure, it's black and white, Sure, it's, um, you know, some of the stuff didn't have sound, right? But it's still viewed in the same way. And I can't see that changing. Sure, we might have, you know, he's saying holograms and we might view it differently, but the content itself will relatively remain in a similar sort of format, right? That you capture the, the footage and you play it, right? And yeah. I don't see video as a format, like kind of drastically changing, even if it does change. I mean, I still see it beneficial value on the archiving, like in terms of being able to look back. So like right now, if you want to learn about history, you can find like, you know, old journals and old articles from, you know, a hundred years ago. And then, you know, you can kind of research and kind of, it takes you back in time. Now, if you've got this video library of stuff that we've actually got captured, if you did want to take a look back into time a hundred years ago, then if YouTube still exists, you'd be able to do that. Like you'd be able to look back and see, oh, this is this is what was happening at that time. But then the other side of me kind of thinks, right now, 500 hours of YouTube video is being uploaded every single minute, right? That's a mm -hmm. lot of stuff. And let's be real here. 
a lot of that is useless content that nobody watches, <laughs> okay, right? <laughs> it might be somebody's, I mean, it might be like a personal archive. So a lot of people kind of like just put videos up there. It might be private, but it might just be for family viewing, etc. But that's yeah. a lot of data. Now, obviously data changes. I mean, like right now, the full YouTube library that we have, you know, in a hundred years time might be something that's, you know, the equivalent of what we have as, you know, a few gig right now on a personal computer. <laughs> it might be yeah. the equivalent of that with, with you know, how if, if data expands and stuff like that. But it, but it also kind of like, you know, raises the question for me is just like, if this carries on, they're going to have so, so much data. Is, is it going to come to a point where they're going to be like, okay, we're going to start, you know, if there's something that's not been viewed in 20 years, that's yeah. going to go into a separate archive. It's no point oh, no, no, leaving it in the same way. Absolutely. I think that's going to happen. But I think one of the biggest things we're going to get because of the way video is moving, you're talking about YouTube, right? And it's funny how you mentioned YouTube, how much useless data, but think about someone like TikTok as it grows where, you know, every second there's just some new content people post on TikTok. Granted, it's shorter, but just again, just the volume of content in general. And I think what this is going to help do is number one, help us get better video codecs, better compression, um, filming so that you know because eventually 4k footage file size wise will feel like how we used to film stuff in 720 and it literally should because you know cameras are also going to get better they're going to get bigger sensors sharper resolution things like that so i think it, it's it's a race of of reducing size or maybe even it then forces us to capture video in a very different way with a new type of sensor that changes everything. But again, it's going to force us because like you mentioned, there's so much content and especially if people are paying for that content, you still have to kind of keep some of it around, right? So there has to be better ways of compression and or archiving or archiving and archive retrieval that's fast enough where people you know, can still see this stuff down the line. But it reminds me of a lot of the sci-fi novels I, I, I listen to and, and read. There's one I was listening to recently that said, um, oh yeah, you know, you could get that novel, like this TV show from Earth. And the guy was like, well, I couldn't find the archive. They're like, yeah, there's like hundreds of different archives from different eras and generations because they just had to cut it off and archive things away. <laughs> and this was like a thousand years in the future. So I was like, all right, yeah, yeah that definitely makes sense. So, I mean, I, I think, I mean, it's going to carry on, obviously, and, and unless something drastic happens, uh, you know, if it does carry on, I think there will be a process of, okay, this video has not had a single view in 50 years. It's going to go either going to be removed or it's going to be archived into a separate sort of library, which is not, it's it's you're going to kind of have to go through to, to be able to retrieve that. So it might not be True, completely yeah. deleted, but it's not going to be, because otherwise, like, you know, when you're searching for something, there's just so much just endless content. So you'll see one of 675 million results, right? It's just not mm -hmm. going to be practical that way, is it? So I think eventually it's going to come to a point like, you know, obviously YouTube's been going on for whatever, 15, 16 years or however long it's been, right? And then it's going to come to a point where it's just going to be like, okay, it's been 50 years. We've got so much of this content that's just sitting there. It's time to stop archiving it and the other thing that was interesting that a few people mentioned is what about if the creators that put that content online are no longer alive right and then what somebody was suggesting would there be a separate website for it and i was like yeah there's going to be a separate website which is going to be called you dead jk or dead to you no that's very interesting because also there are creators who have passed away that we know like you know maybe yeah. not personally but we watch and their content is still live on 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 youtube right and i think it, it raises a very interesting point i think the other point that i wanted to bring up quickly is i think we are getting to the point even now that we need a standard solution and i Look, I'm sorry, every company does this. This is my codec, that's my codec, Sony codec, Canon, Apple, Micro. Like, I'm tired of that rubbish. Like, we all need to come together and, you know, come up with a codec platform that is effective, it's better. You know, I know how we've all tried to push the H.264, 265, so that it's, it just, it's just easier down the road because it's going to make those kind of problems, which I don't think a lot of companies are thinking about it. But down the road, just being able to access video, archiving, all that stuff. And yeah, I'm just tired of different codecs because trust me, <laughs> when we edit video, it's like, mm, it's like okay, do I need to get this one? Well. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Now, but I, I, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. But what's interesting is like, you know, like I'm kind of thinking, okay, say your content's online. Now, now obviously, you know, even if you live 120 years, which I really hope you will, and maybe longer, mm. um, inshallah, uh, God willing, um, this obviously as, as humans, there's always going to be a point where there's going to be a cutoff, right? You, you, you're yeah. not going to live forever. It's, it's really kind of intriguing to think that your content will still be live well, for people to kind of yeah we'll, we'll we'll outlive you so i don't know maybe you'll you know if if you have like great grandkids like my my great grandkids will be kind of like oh that was my great great because like right now when i look back at photos of like my great great grandparents right and stuff and i'm like oh man that's like just literally got like one two maybe photos one, very, exactly, very old yeah. school. and then here you've got literally a collection of hours and hours of footage which you could be like oh hey you know, this is my granddad who's, you know, my great great grandfather who was a YouTuber who had a million followers, which is kind of small right now because everybody has a million followers now. I know. <laughs> or right? Something yeah. like that. I, I think I think what, what he does what you just said brings up a good point. I think everyone should record content. Not you don't have to share it on YouTube. Um but save it somewhere that you can share later on with family and friends. You made a very good point there. It's the fact that like um I would have loved to see my see my mom when she was younger in college, and she talked about like her friends and the things she did. And I mean, I saw photos, but you know, even for me, they're very static. And granted, my mom had m multiple photos, as, as opposed to now, where um, if I want to describe, like, if, if I w wanted to tell, you know, my mom was like, oh, "I have a friend his name is Saf," I can send the video, and then she, you know, you kind of see the person and you see how they are, and you see at least a glimpse of them as opposed to just a static photo. So I would suggest that people should at least try and share more video content, especially family members that are far away that you care about or you talk to because it just keeps the memory more vivid. Okay, I just had, I had, I had an idea, right? Okay, <laughs> maybe what we should do is record a video for our future selves or our future grandkids or something, right? And uh -huh. upload it onto YouTube as private but have like maybe a future published date or have that there. So I don't know if we're still alive in 20 years, right? Or something, we can look back yeah. at it and we can kind of see what's changed. And yeah, that. Uh, what, what do you reckon? Should we do that? Should we, so we, should we set that as a challenge? Let's, yeah, I agree. Let's do, actually, instead of just 20, let's do like 10 because I think it's also good for us to just be able to like see it pop up. Because we might not be doing YouTube anymore by then, right? What, whatever happens, right? Who knows? And then <laughs> 10 years from now, if we just see a notification of video publish, you're like, oh, snap. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. What, what was I thinking? I thought this YouTube yeah. thing's going to last forever. It didn't. <laughs> People start watching me. It's, it's, it's funny because I was um, having a conversation with my nieces and, you know, we were talking about because there's a lot of YouTubers who obviously come and go, right? And yeah. that's one of the questions we have. It's like, are we still going to be making videos now? You know, as far as I can see, I'll still be making videos. I'll be an older guy, right? Maybe I'll have a gray beard. Maybe you'll think I'm cool. Uh, you know, great gray beard guy with a, you know, uh, maybe I'll change my name to Uncle Super Seth. I don't know. <laughs> but because it's interesting because there are creators that are older than us who are still creating really good content and people are still watching, yeah. right? Yeah. And I, I think obviously you, you probably have a different audience maybe, but I think that's one of the advantages we have with tech is that we can still cover tech. Like, you know, more recently yes, covering electronic vehicles right which if you ask me um you know three even like five years ago i'd be like I, I don't think i'd be doing that but now i'm I'm doing that so obviously you adapt with time you never know maybe in 10 years time we'll still be making content we'll see all right cool well let's That's let's big, hope we're, we're that'll gonna, be a good challenge yeah it'll be a good challenge so we'll we'll, we'll see how that goes again we, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow so um <laughs> who knows if we'll be around but God willing, inshallah, we'll still be around in 10 years and maybe we'll still be making content and maybe you guys will still be listening and watching. And we really do appreciate you guys tuning in for this episode. Um, obviously, some usual tech stuff, but also some other stuff, which is just fun to talk about. Hope you enjoyed it. If you want to get involved, then do give us a follow on our social media channels and we can also suggest topics for future episodes. And... Uh, 
drop a rating whenever this comes back on Apple Podcasts and also get involved on the clips on YouTube where I think there's most of the engagement is on the clips. People enjoy watching the clips more than anything else. Thanks for listening. This is Saf on Super Saf Speaks with my co-host. Thunder E from Border Work. And we'll see you next time.